Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you look marvelous tonight. <clears throat> marvelous. You got to say marvelous. <laughs> okay. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you guys are all doing great today. Well, we're going to continue our, um, our message series called Matters of the Heart. And today I'll share a message called Being Gracious Matters. Well, in this generation, we're seeing a decline in our society in the way we value, respect, and treat one another in our everyday lives. We see it with the lack of respect in our homes, you know, with the rise of domestic violence and child abuse, in our schools with the rise of student bullying and mistreatment of teachers by students. We also see a lack of respect in our workplace and, yes, sometimes even in our churches. But this was not so many generations ago. Our nation, the United States of America, was founded by Bible-believing Christians and was based on Christian principles, right? Our founding fathers envisioned a government that would promote and encourage Christianity. And so an example I want to share with you of an original standard of conduct for students at Harvard University, uh, it was started back in 1636, and this is what they wrote. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Therefore, to lay Jesus Christ as the only foundation for our children to follow the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. That was from Harvard University. Wow. So you can imagine today if our nation continued on that track, right, putting the Bible as our foundation, um, following the Ten Commandments, where would we be today? We would be a much different nation. Do you agree? Uh, but you know what? It's not too late because we as Christians, we can continue to uphold the principles, the godly principles of the Word of God and live it out in our lives and teach our children. So it's not too late. So the question is, how do we cultivate this kind of a, a spirit that uh, God desires for our hearts? Well, I want to show you a, a, a picture here. And this is from George Bernard Shaw. He's a Nobel Prize winner back in the 1925s, and he wrote the movie My Fair Lady for all of you. Way, it's way back in the 1925s, right? I know, you're like, wow. Well. Uh, well, he wrote this. The great secret is not having bad manners or good manners, but having the same manner for all human souls. Ooh, isn't that good? That's good stuff. He goes on to say in this other quote, behaving as if you're in heaven where there are no third-class carriages, for one soul is as good as another. Wow. Isn't that good? So the key here is that we must treat every soul, every person that we meet, uh, with love and kindness. Every soul is important to God. Yes, you, you, and you, right? It doesn't matter what upbringing you've come from, um, you know, how much money you have in the bank. Every soul is important to God. God has no favorites either, and he treats everyone the same, and so should we. So manners are something that we use every day, right? To make a good impression on people, to make feel good about yourself. So practicing manners are important. But, you know, we think of, oh, good manners, oh, open the door for people, say please, right, and thank you. But it goes much deeper. It says true courtesy goes much deeper. Being polite and courteous means considering how others are feeling. So if you practice good manners, you're showing those around you that you're considerate of their feelings and are respectful to them. So I was, and when I was uh, reading up on this, I thought, hmm, manners, and just matters of the heart. I, I believe there's a connection to that. I want to connect these two today in my message. So manners and just being a person of graciousness, I really believe that's, that's connected to one another. And we're going to talk more about that. So it all starts with our hearts and knowing the heart of God. So how do we become a person of graciousness? Well, number one in your notes, it says, we must understand that as grace-filled believers, we serve a God of grace right? So Joel 2.13 says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Can you underline gracious and merciful? Slow to anger 
and great kindness. So we serve a God of grace that is kind, gracious, merciful, slow to anger. Wow, we serve a great and mighty God. But, you know, it's sad to see some people still look at God and he, they fear him as being an angry, judgmental, and punitive deity. But we can see in the scripture right here, that's not true. We serve a God of grace. He is a loving, kind God. The Bible says he's quick to forgive, to pardon. His love covers a multitude of sin. That is the God that we serve. So whenever we doubt God's goodness and grace, my, may I encourage you, go back to the word of God and read of, of just the beauty of who, the kind of God that we serve. He has an amazing heart, and he loves you and me. In fact, there are 47 scriptures in the Bible that speak about the grace of God and 67 plus scriptures that speak about the love of God. That's over 114 love letters to us from God in his word that he loves us. So when you're feeling like, oh, God doesn't love me, oh, I messed up God, and oh, you know, oh, there I go again, come into sin, Lord, you're not going to forget. Know that that's not how God thinks. And I want to clear it up right now. Don't let the enemy speak to you to tell you that God is not pleased with you. He loves you. He is passionately pursuing you. And he died. He sent Jesus on the cross to die for you so that we can be forgiven. And like we talked about, right, we're moving forward. God has a great plan in store for all of us. We just need to trust in him. So how, do we, how can we be equipped to be a, a person of graciousness? How does it look like in the life of a believer? Well, I believe we are grace in action. Let's look at the qualities of a gracious person. So being gracious, well-mannered, in your notes here, it says pleasant, kind, considerate, courteous, tactful, respectful, merciful, and compassionate. Hmm. Can you think of other people that you know that are gracious? Do you see uh, these characteristics in your life? Well, if you do, applaud yourself, give yourself a pat on the shoulder. Good job, good job. <laughs> you know, you're making right choices to cultivate a heart of graciousness in your life. Well, let's look at the opposite of being gracious, which is ungracious. Look at the qualities of an ungracious person. Unrefined, rude, disrespectful, unkind, impolite, discourteous, harsh, and ill-mannered. Wow. Do you know of anyone who's like that? Don't look at your neighbor. No, not on your spouse. <laughs> or do you see those qualities evident in your life at times? I know some of you say, yeah, maybe if I had a hard day and traffic is bad, <laughs> or if I'm tired, you know, I mean, we're all human, right? We're not perfect. We all have days that at times we can be ungracious, and that's, that's okay. But if we continue to see these qualities of being ungracious in our lives, a continual presence in us, then we have to ask ourselves why. So what, what I do, and I'll give you a peek of the, the things that I go through when I find myself being ungracious, and my husband always calls me ratchet, right? Um, I'm from Kalihi, hey. No. <laughs> no, but, you know, I can be kind of a uh, more of a firm person. Ha <laughs> ha! But I'm really sweet inside. Really, I am, though. No. <laughs> But when I go through times of ungraciousness or I'm just like really harsh, you know, especially with my family, my kids, I have to stop and ask myself, what's going on, Lisa? What's going on inside of you? What's fueling this frustration? Because when we, we're mean to each other or we're ungracious or we're impolite and harsh, something is going on inside. So stop, self-examine your heart, and just go to God and say, God, what's going on? And then I bet you you're going to say, I'm so stressed at work. I'm tired, I'm not feeling good, you know, um, I'm, I'm going, having problems with my spouse, my kids. There's always something internal going on. So we can easily blame the outward situation, external, you know, situation or the people around us, our coworkers and all that. But really it's inside. And so we have to say, what's going on inside? So that's what I do. I say, God, well, wait, what's going on that I'm, I'm being ungracious? And the Lord always, he's quick to show me because he loves me, right? He shows me quickly, this, Lisa, you're struggling or you're frustrated with this in your heart. What's, what's going on? And I just, and a lot of times, and I know a lot of, um, 
we, uh, that we go through is that we have unforgiveness. Somebody has hurt us, and we're carrying that. And so we're angry inside about somebody. And so we need to get that right in our hearts, or we'll continue to be ungracious. Yeah, Lord, I know this, the word says I need to be loving and kind, but I'm not. Then you need to look within your heart. So as believers in Christ, God is transforming us inside and out. And so the best thing is to start within and watch how we treat ourselves, the words that we speak to ourselves, as well as how we treat other people. But the choice is up to us, right? Uh, you can hear this message and other great messages this coming months about matters of the heart, but the choice is up to us. And we need to go before the Lord and say, God, search my heart, search my heart and, and show me any wicked way that I may repent and change, right? Because we're moving forward, right? God has great things for us. But as I was worshiping down there and I was praying that song and asking the Lord to do work in me, I felt the Lord say, Lisa, really, you can't change yourself. You can do your best to make right choices, but you can't change yourself. Only the Lord can change you. So when we're worshiping and singing those songs like that and you're struggling with errors in your life, just say, Lord, change me. I, I can't change myself, you know. If you've always had an anger problem or, you know, just different issues in your life, if you're more of a harsh person or different things like that, uh, just go to the Lord and just say, God, change my heart. And he will. He will. God is an amazing God. In the book of Proverbs, the Bible talks a lot about being a wise or foolish person and the blessings or consequences that come with those choices. And I want to read the scripture. It's not in your notes, but it talks about a wise person. A wise person has a deep reverence and respect for God and his word. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So a wise person has a teachable spirit. Can we say that? A wise person has a teachable spirit. Right. So wise people, they're willing to learn from God and others. They're open for input. They ask, hey, you know, show me, teach me. I want to learn. They're open to learn from others. They also learn the mistakes of other people, and they learn from that. And when they make mistakes, they learn not to do that again, and they make right choices. On the other hand, the Bible talks about a fool. And a fool is a person who disregards God's word. Psalms 14.1 says, Only fools say in their hearts, There is no God. They are corrupt, and their actions are evil, and not one of them does good. So a foolish person is quite the opposite. They don't want to receive instruction. They're unteachable. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. They want to do things their way. And they're foolish because their end, the Bible says, is destruction. So, for example, if I tell you, hey, that wall over there, guys, if you ran into it, it's really hard. Your face can get all bust up, you know? So... The fools go, yeah, that's what she thinks, but, you know, I'm just going to do it anyway. So the fool runs to the wall, smash that wall. Oh, my God. Wow. I'm all bust up now. I told you. But later on, I'll see that fool again running to the wall. <laughs> Hit that wall. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, my nose are bust. And then later on again, I'll see that fool running to the wall. And, right? Right? Wouldn't you say... A stupid other guy, hello. <laughs> Foolish, right? Right? But a wise person would do this. He'd be standing there seeing the fool run to the wall, boom! And he'd be like, ooh, wall hard. You know, soft. Oh, oh boss, looking all bleeding. I ain't doing that. And he'd just walk away. I ain't doing that, right? How many of you want to be that wise person to learn from mistakes? But sometimes we make mistakes. So sometimes a wise person may run into their wall, Hit that wall. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you're right. I'm never going to do that again. And they choose not to go that route again. That is what God says a wise person should do. But how many of us know, right? And you think about your own life. Yeah, Vasisa, I have done things over and over again. Hit that wall over and over again. And I didn't learn my lesson, right? And so it's important that we listen, that we're teachable, that we, and that's why reading the word of God and, and seeing what God says don't do, we don't do. Because, and you watch other people when they're making choices that are wrong and you're seeing the consequences, that alone should tell you don't do that. <laughs> we're all the same, we're all human, right? The principle, the godly principles of our true, it won't come to pass if you don't listen. And so when it comes to being a gracious person, 
especially with the way we conduct ourselves and the words that we speak. Number two, choose to be wise and full of grace or a foolish person lacking grace. Ecclesiastes 10, 12 to 13 says, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. Can you underline that? Words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. But it says, the lips of a fool will swallow him up, will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Wow. So let's focus on that. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. So if you are wise, if you think, I'm considered pretty wise, you know, I know the word of God, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a walking in the ways of the Lord, I'm mature in Christ, then let's look at the words that you speak. Is it gracious? And so the Lord says, be careful about the words that come out of your mouth. They say this, your words aren't yours anymore once you say it, so think hard before letting a word go. You ever had that happen to you? In the midst of anger and you're frustrated, you're just like, ah, you just say it. To, you know, especially those that you love, right, the ones closest to you. And then you regret, oh, I wish I could just pull back those words, <laughs> swallow it back. But words, right? They say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is that true? No, words are very powerful. They can either give life or death. In fact, I just saw on the news, uh, this kid was being bullied, and he ended up ending his life just of the words that were spoken to him. Wow. And so the words that we speak are very powerful. So I believe that's why the Lord says when you, have a, when you meet a person who's gracious and kind and loving, you will see that that person is very wise. And I love my husband because I really believe he's such a wise man of God. He says very little. And that's what the Bible says. There's a scripture about that, right? Not saying much. Because you meet someone who just talks and talks and talks. The percentage of saying an unwise word and a foolish word is very high, like, like I do at times, you know. But my husband, he speaks very little, but the words that he speaks hold power. Even my children can say that. Uh, it comes out of the blue, but it's like, wow, it's really deep thoughts, you know, like Yoda kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. You know, throughout my career, I've had... Uh, opportunities. Um, I've held positions of authority throughout my life. I was an office manager back in Hawaii, a, a teacher here at Clark County, a pastor, and most importantly, a mom of two children. And I've had to learn the power of, excuse me, I had to learn that my words hold power. And, um, you know, sometimes I did great, and sometimes, oh, the words that I spoke, it really hurt people. So I had to come before people, and I said, I'm so sorry you know, uh, especially as your leader or as your employer, that I said these words. I may have said it in, um, in a harsh tone, but I'm, I'm really sorry. And I've learned to humble myself uh, when I have spoken out of turn. And this is what the Lord showed me, especially now as a pastor, right? Um, he said, Lisa, go and humble yourself before that person. And I was like, well, it was both our faults. You know, I'm like making conversations. Like, well, God, it's both. And he said, but I'm, I'm talking to you, right? Go and do that, humble yourself, because you're modeling to the person how you should do it. You get it? So even though maybe that person was the one who started it, I am so sorry that I spoke out of turn or I said really harsh things to you. I'm so sorry. And it just models to that person how a wise person should be. And as a pastor, right, we're examples. And so uh, just let me tell you, working on this message has been a challenge for me. <laughs> I will be truthful. Um, and I said, Lord, why do I have to do this message? Uh, because, <laughs> because I feel like I can be open with you guys because you may think, ah, Pastor Lisa, she's perfect. She's so gracious. <laughs> not, at all not at all times. I struggle. But I'm human, and I'm working towards being gracious. Amen? <laughs> not the best, but hard to beat. Amen? <laughs> So in my positions of authority, I had to learn how to communicate grace to people, but still giving correction. Because we have to be balanced, right? It can't be a person of grace and, oh, you know, and sometimes it can be taken too much to an extreme. So you have to balance that. And I call this the Oreo effect that we learn um, in leadership books and in management. 
And this is a, a constructive way to give criticism with grace. So I'm going to share with you if you're not aware of it. So as a parent, an employer, a ministry leader, you can use this Oreo technique. So first you need to highlight the person's uh, strengths. Even talking to your child, to your spouse, to your employer, to the co-workers, right? You highlight the person's strengths, uh, and then you address the errors that need to be corrected in a graceful, tactful way. And then you end your discussion, again, encouraging, bringing encouraging words to that person that leaves them feeling uplifted. That's grace in action. And I've had to learn to time to how to communicate in the midst of feeling frustrated and angry, right? If someone's just so angry, upset, uh, that's not a good time to speak to someone, by the way. Take some time <laughs> to dial down, to, to pray, and ask what to calm you down, and then you can go and speak. Because it's like, oh, yeah, my words, right? There's power uh, to bring life or death, and so I need to calm down before I communicate my heart. And so God has taught me this through the years to... Um, Help me communicate my thoughts minus all this emotion, right, that I'm feeling. So it's kind of like this. I want to show you a picture uh, of this green-yellow scrub sponge. How many of you guys have ever used that, right? So one side, it's green, right, uh, and abrasive. Everybody said abrasive. Ooh, right? You ever met some people like that? They're rough, ratchet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this side is used to scrub, right? You scrub the dirty dishes or the real dirty, grimy things that you clean. Now, the other side is the yellow side. It's more of the softer side, right? More of the side of, of, of kindness, of, ah, of grace, <laughs> right? Um, the yellow side is kind of like, hey, let's all just, can we all just get along? You know, that kind of people, right? But the green side, right, the green side, I call them scrubs. Hey, no push me around, eh? We think you. Fine. Hey, like they're just in your face, you know, they just tell you straight like it is, right? And, <laughs> and so here we have this, this sponge, and look, it's two-sided. And I feel like God's saying this is how he wants us to be. Because sometimes we're like, oh, no, we're Christians. We got to be full of love and grace and kindness, right? But we have to stand for our standards, right? We can't have people taking advantage of us or, um, you know, especially the things of the world. Or we don't stand for what we believe or our faith. We need to stand. Okay, well, we are people of grace and love and kindness, forgiveness. But the other side is just as important. A lot of times we're pushovers. We're insecure, we don't want to give feedback, we don't like conflict, and so we just want to be yellow, right? The soft side. But God said, this is what I had to learn through the years, by the way, to be um, more assertive in myself and the things that I communicate without being harsh. Um, and so it's the two-sided thing of, of being the sponge. What? Oh, yeah. He's talking to me, he's giving me a... I'm teachable, yes, yes. No. Um, so he's called us like this green scrub sponge, tough yet still tender, ratchet but still righteous. <laughs> That's me. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> and full of God's love for people. But they still need to be a balance. So I'm, I'm still learning uh, this balance. So pray for me and, and be patient with me. But know that I, I just have love for you guys. You know, I love you guys. And, you know, it's funny because in church they call me like the mother of our church. And before, years ago, I didn't like that because I, I felt like I was old, like a mother, you know. How about a sister? <laughs> but I'm seeing now my motherly traits. I'm, your, I'm a spiritual mom. And I look out for your souls, the Bible says, right? We're shepherds. We love you. We look out for you. Sometimes that can be too uh, in your poi kind of thing. And it's like, Pastor Lisa, I need space. But it's because, I, it's because I love you. And sometimes that can be really firm. And sometimes harsh. And I know my husband comes and is like, oh, it's okay. Pastor Lisa loves you. He has to come. Let's, sorry. <laughs> But for those of you, and I've talked to a lot of you, I've, I've had counseling sessions with many of you, especially women, and I've cried with people. I have walked people through some really tough times. And so I'm like, Lord, continue to make me a balanced person, 
to uh, just be pleasing in your sight, tough yet tender. Amen? Amen. God is good. <laughs> All the time. So they say that speech is a barometer, is a barometer of spirituality. In other words, words you speak and how you speak it is an indicator or a gauge to how spiritual you really are. So if we say we're Christians and that we love God and another, then our actions should confirm this. So it's not, I know all the scriptures. I went to seminary. You know, I, I just, I know it all. I've been a Christian now for 20 years. Well, then I look and say, well, how is your speech? How is the words that you speak? How do you treat other people? If you treat people with respect and love and kindness, if the words you speak are uplifting and encouraging, then I'm like, ah, now that's a mature Christian in Christ who loves God, who's very spiritualized of God, right? It's your actions. It's your heart. It's not so much your head knowledge, but it's in what's inside your heart. And so your speech is a barometer of spirituality. Ephesians 4.29 says, No foul language is to come from your mouth, but only what is good for, bu for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Right? So I like that. Uh, underline only what is good for building up someone in need. My mom used to always say, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, just don't say it. But it's hard, right? We just want to blab the stuff, right? <laughs> gossip. We want to tell the junk stuff. But I train myself to always speak well of others and to, um, to even tell them, wow, I just, I really encourage people. Oh, I love that. Thank you for doing that. I see you th doing this for God. I see you growing. I'm always trying to uplift and encourage others because I myself um, love that when people encourage me. And so we live in a very dark world. And I know you've Folks, go home to your homes and your workplaces, and sometimes it can be very dark where you're not getting the encouragement. But let this house, New Hope Las Vegas, be a house of God where we encourage, where we uplift, right? We build up and we speak well of one another. Amen? And, and it will give grace. I like this, but it gives grace to those who hear. So you can imagine telling someone, hey, you know, so-and-so did this, and I'm talking stink about someone. Am I bringing grace to this person, even though it's, I'm talking about someone else? All right. It's polluting their hearts and their spirits toward that person. So we want to bring grace to everyone who hears us, every conversation that we have. So the question is, how do you extend grace to others when they hurt you? Hmm. Well, people say and do things all the time that may hurt your feelings. In fact, the other day, my husband... No, let me jump. <laughs> uh, no, ratchet. No, no. We've been married 22 years now. We have learned, yeah, we have learned to extend grace to each other and to overlook our, our weaknesses, right, Kent? To over, overlook his problems? No. <laughs> to extend grace. <laughs> so the tendency, we want to repay evil for evil, right? Someone says something, we're like, ooh, that's it, I'm giving a piece of my mind, right? It's just human nature. We just want to fight back. And I've had to learn through the years to just, ugh, I want to tell you off, but I can't, you know? And now that I'm a pastor, even more so, right? Um, but <laughs> so the Lord will bring me in so much situations, and especially when I was substitute teaching at Clark County, wow, you know, being around the kids, the things they would say to me, even other teachers. And every time, especially when it's other teachers, and you're a sub, so you're there for like a day, and sometimes the teachers, they're stressed out, and they say things that are very cutting to you or to others, you know, one another. And so I was in a situation where um, this teacher kind of reprimanded me in front of my class, and I just was, ooh. And I felt the Lord said, this is your chance. This is a test. And I just looked at her and I said, I am so sorry. I didn't know that was a procedure. I'm so sorry. And I, I felt this small, though because the words are really cutting like I was stupid, you know. But I just, I'm so sorry. And I walked away, and I just said, yes, God, I passed the test. Because years prior to that, I'd be like, yeah, what, what? The neck, you know, the neck. Outside, Outside let's go. <laughs> Ooh, Kalihi, okay. So I'm like, I passed the test. He's like, good. And he would bring the test coming around and around again. Right? So I'm like, it's an it's a opportunity for me to show humility 
Because really, when you're a humble person and someone's ragging on you, especially in public, when you humble yourself and say, I'm sorry, and that person continues to rag on you, they look like a fool, really, in the eyes of the people. So and then the people around you will have more compassion and, and mercy, right, instead of you trying to fight and all that. So that's what I've learned. And it just goes right back to them. So I had to learn. And it takes um, the testings of God where people will come and say, speak harsh words to me. And the question is, how am I going to respond to that? I rather seek to understand rather than under, the understood. Because I'm like, wow, it's like that, that teacher, I know she was stressed that day. And so she just, I was there in the room and she just got it out all of me. And I thought, wow, she must be really stressed out. So later that day, I said, how are you doing? How's it going? And then she just said, oh, it's been so, such a bad day. The kids are driving me crazy. I said, oh, yeah, I know. I'm so sorry to hear that. And days after, it was fine. But, you know, I understood uh, where she was coming from and why she was so stressed out. I want to tell you this quick story. This is back in Hawaii. Um, I worked at a nonprofit organization. I was the office manager there. And I had a team of clerical people under me. And so we would have staff come in, and a lot of them were social workers with masters and PhDs. And so when they would come in and we hire them and all that, we would set them up in their office, get their computer running and all that. Well, <clears throat> recently we, at that time, I, we hired this woman from the mainland. And I was at the front desk when she came, and she just ragged on my receptionist. You know, my, I had problems with my computer. I didn't get all my supplies. What kind of place is this? I mean, she went off. And she didn't know I was standing behind her. So I just kind of kept mental note. And um, my receptionist handled it well. And then she stormed off. And my receptionist said, what's up with this lady? Ever since we hired her, she just, like, there's nothing that can make her happy. She's just upset all the time. So this would, ha would, ha would go on for a couple weeks. And I would notice that. And because I didn't really say anything, I was, I was having resentful feelings towards her. Because this organization that we're in, it was a very... It was a great environment, work environment. We had respect and love for one another. And so in my heart, I think I was judging her. I had some unforgiveness in my heart because the way she was treating my staff. Well, I remember this one day, um, one of the staff people came to me and she said, hey, you know, we're starting like a prayer gathering. Um, this every week, we're going to start it this on Wednesdays. And today's Wednesdays, we're going to start it, so please come and check out our prayer gathering. I said, wow, great. So I go upstairs in our conference room. I open the door, and who do I see in that room? That lady. So I'm like, oh, OK. All right. <laughs> so I'm in the circle, and we're going around sharing, you know, uh, if our, our walk with the Lord and what church we go to. And for example, I'll give her name Jane. And she goes, hi, I'm Jane. And I go to New Hope, Oahu. I've been a Christian now for years. I've been a Christian for quite some time. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, oh, really? You know, I couldn't tell. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that to her. I'm thinking it. And then, I, you know how you sense the Lord just come right in and he said, Lisa, can you be a friend to her and be gracious and kind? And I'm just like, Phew. She's a Christian, for God's sake. I mean, she's a Christian, the Lord. He said, just, just wait and listen. So she, she comes and she shares that, and she said, hey, guys, I need prayer. She said, I just found out recently that I have cancer, breast cancer, and I'm going through a lot of stress. My, my kids and my family, we just moved here. We're new to town, and I don't really know anyone. Yeah, I go to church, but I'm not connected. I just need prayer. I'm stressed out. I just felt this small. And when the Lord said, be a friend to her, show her loving, kindness, and grace, listen, because you're going to hear something to show why she has been so angry and frustrated and, you know, treating us so unkindly and graciously. And so what was interesting was we got to pray with her, and through that time, our relationship started to develop. We would see each other at church. Um, I, would, I met her family. She went to chemotherapy and all that. And I watched this woman who was so hard on the outside soften. And we would pray for her at church, at work. I just loved on her. And I remember what God said, can you just be a friend? Just love her. And I saw her heart soften, soften to a place where she came out of her therapy great. She's cancer-free. And just her, her, 
Isn't that awesome? Her countenance changed months down the line, and I just was like, wow. And this is what the Lord showed me. He said, as Christians, right, we have the, the, we have the Holy Spirit in us, the love of God. So we can love those porcupines, you know, those porcupine people, right? Those scrubs, right, that are so abrasive, right? I can embrace those scrubs because I have Christ in me. I don't have to sit like judge and jury. Oh, I, I almost want to cut her off. I don't want to be in it. God's like, well, I, put, I put my love in you, my grace in you. This is your time to showcase it, to love on them, right? Because you don't know what they're going through. So in point three, we are messengers of grace to this hurting world. He sent you in your job, to your job, right where you're at. He sent you in the school that you're at, if you're a student. He sent you to these places where you're, you're meeting a lot of abrasive scrub people. <laughs> these scrubs, right? So you can either say, I'm out of here. I don't want yeah, to be their friend. Why should I, you know? I don't want to be around that kind of negativity. That's why you need to ask the Lord, God, is this negativity going to affect me and pull me down? But when he says, be a friend, be a friend to many and love them with the grace of God, may, may I encourage you to do so and step out and get to know their story because there's a reason why they're harsh like that and they're mean and unkind. There's, there's a reason. And that's my, uh, my goal as a pastor when I get to know people. I, I want to know what's going on in your life. What has led you to this place of being uh, such a hard person, a hardened heart? And let the Lord's love come. I love Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Isn't that good? I like that. Underline, let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt with salt. So what the scripture is saying is in all your conversations, be gracious and speak well of others, especially with non-believers, because this will give you an opportunity to share God's love with them. And also God wants you to be careful in the things that you say, so be gracious and kind in your speech, because you never know who you are talking to. You know, I, I recently took my son Lucas to a job interview. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. He's making his own money now. <laughs> so we went in, um, and, you know, I was kind of prepping him for the interview, and I said, you got this, Lucas. So he went in with this woman uh, for an interview, and right after that, she came out, and she said, are you Lucas' mom? And I said, yes. And this is what she said. She said, you have a great son. She shook my hand. You have a great son. What a gracious, kind young person. If all the young people were like this, this world would be a better place. <laughs> tears, tears. Right? I was like, oh, thank you. I said, oh, yeah, he's such a blessing. And she, she was just impressed with him. He just did a great job in the interview. And you know my son, he's just a very, he gets along well with everyone. Uh, very respectful. And we have trained him up that way, to be respectful and kind. And so she, because she was so impressed with him, I believe the Lord gave him favor through her, and he got hired within a week. So, woo -hoo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that good? So I told him, let's go a step further. I want you to write a thank you card to this woman, because she gave him a business card, and he just sent her a, a thank you card thanking her, right? She sees his application. He's never had a job before, a paying job. So he puts all his volunteer opportunities here at church. So she knows he's a Christian. He goes to New Hope, and hopefully... She's so impressed, she may come and visit, right, our church. You never know. You never know, right? So, but I said, be an example, Lucas, and this is how you show your gratefulness, your thankfulness is to thank people such as these, because you never know, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the way we act toward outsiders is so important because the Bible says we are uh, like billboards to the Lord. People are reading, especially if you say, I'm a Christian, so they're watching you, right? The eye, all eyes are on you. And I like this scripture in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, and it says, You are our epistle. Another word for epistle is letter. Written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. 
not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. Wow. So we're letters read by all men. Are people reading your letters and say, oh, junk this letter? <laughs> what? They call themselves Christian. Couldn't tell, right? Or, wow, check this person out, the way they speak, the way they act and treat people. Oh, yeah, they're Christians. They're living up to that name, Christian, right? God, our, God people are reading us, our lives, how we act. Okay, we're not perfect. We'll make mistakes. And that's when you just say, I'm sorry, and you apologize and move on. But know that the world is watching. I, I'm going to close with this. I uh, read this from a Christian author, and he said, Listen, child of God, people are watching you. They are reading your life and seeing if your epistle or letter lives up to the intent of the author, which is God. There is not so powerful a sermon in the world as a consistent Christian life. The eye of the world takes in more than the ear. Our lives as believers are the only religious books the world may ever read. Wow, wow. Isn't that good? So my, may I encourage you today, graciousness ma matters. It's the way we treat one another with kindness, respect, love. You know, saying please, thank you. Hey, I'm sorry. You're welcome. These manners, they're not of the old. They're, today we need to continue to teach that to our children, right? Uh, we need to be examples to, to those around us, and they'll catch. And, you know, especially because you don't see those manners, right? You don't see these good manners. People are just like, wow. They're kind of shocked because they don't see that. Like this lady who interviewed Lucas, she was shocked. And it's a safe key position, and she interviews all young people. So you can imagine he stood out above the rest, and it was because he had such a graciousness about him. So may I encourage you today to be that, that, that messenger, uh, that light to this hurting world of grace and of loving and kindness. And you watch you'll see people say, hey, tell me more about uh, your Christianity, this church that you go to, this God you serve. I want to be there. I want to I wanna know more about God. And you watch the Lord use it to bring many to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen.